State Representative John Santiago joins us live this morning. Let's go on the record. More than just a legislator, he is also Dr. John Santiago, an ER physician at Boston Medical Center. His unique perspective from the front line of the battle against COVID-19. From WCVB Channel 5, the inside word from Washington to Beacon Hill. Today's newsmakers are going on the record. And welcome to OTR on this last weekend in April. Still, unfortunately, in the thick of the coronavirus crisis. I'm Ed Harding along with New Center 5's political reporter Janet Wu this morning. And we do continue to respect social distancing. As you can see, we bring you the latest information on COVID-19 right through it. And as I mentioned just a few seconds ago, our guest this morning is State Representative John Santiago, who is also an ER doctor and has seen the ravages of this virus from a very close range. He joins us live right now at the State House this morning. Dr. Rep. Santiago, thank you for joining us this morning. Good morning, Doctor. Good morning. Happy to be here. Good morning. Um, Massachusetts now officially a hot spot, as you know. Uh, so I guess the big question is, are we better at testing and victims are more honest about their status here? Or is the virus actually spreading more here? Well, I mean, there are a couple of components that's really difficult to tell at this time. What I can tell you is that Massachusetts has scaled up testing in an aggressive fashion. I think we are number one in the, in the country right now in terms of per capita testing. But of course, when you test more, you're going to have more positive uh, patients. And so it remains to be seen as we, uh, as the next, next couple of weeks uh, proceed. But as long as we're testing and we're doing the proper contact tracing, my guess is that we'll be on the backside of this virus hopefully in the next couple of weeks. Do you think that there is enough testing out there now for us to actually think about opening within the next couple of weeks? Or do we have to be more aggressive about the testing? Well, listen, I think we should be handling the public health crisis right now before we even discuss opening the economy. The virus is really going to dictate the opening. Um, luckily, we as a government and as public officials and the public at large will have an important role in drawing the contours of that. Mm -hmm. But right now, we need to be focused on the lives and the infections and, and uh, trying to avoid as many deaths as we possibly can. But, right. are, but do, more, do more tests have to be made available in order to even think about um, to op opening things up? No, I, I would agree. We, we need more tests across this whole country, and including the Commonwealth. I mean, when it comes to nursing homes and communities of color, two primary hotspots in the Commonwealth, we definitely need more testing. And we've moved in that direction, particularly in the city of Boston, you know, thanks to Mayor Walsh and his team. We've opened up 50 new testing sites, uh, particularly those in communities of color. I mean, those are the, the parts of the Commonwealth that are the hardest hit, and we need to be acting aggressively um, in those areas. So, so, Doctor, let's break that down a little bit. It, 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 let, let's go through a few things. First of all, who is showing sure. up at the emergency room, particularly that you see at, at Boston Medical Center? Who's showing up? You, you know, it's an interesting thing. When the epidemic started, a lot of us presumed that the emergency department was going to be quite full of people. But what we've noticed early on, and I've been, you know, working pretty much every Sat Friday, Saturday, Sunday since the pandemic started, that it's actually been significantly slower. I mean, estimates from 40 to 50 percent down in volume. Now, that doesn't mean our job as emergency medicine doctors is any less easy. Mm -hmm. Patients are coming in quite sick. Um, you know, you have to don and doff PPE. And so people are still coming in. What I found over the past couple of weeks is that people are coming in who have been, let's say, diagnosed a week or so ago, right. but are returning with more significant symptoms, often requiring so, the ICU and ventilators. So are, are those people, are, are they older? Are they folks who have one or two or many preconditions? Are they, are they people of color? Draw a picture for us as to who is coming in with the COVID-19. Well, there, a lot of them are people of color. I mean, this epidemic is disproportionately impacting communities of color, and that's for a host of reasons. I mean, these are communities that have long-standing health inequities. There are communities that have a, a disproportionate amount of essential workers, and they have to they live in houses where they're inter, inter, intergenerational housing, and so they're often exposing themselves to the virus. And so they're older people, sicker people, people with chronic lung disease. But make no mistake, I'm seeing young people as well come to the emergency department requiring admission, requiring uh, additional ox oxygenation. Um, we hear a lot about ventilators. I'm gonna ask you a question that's sort of three-pronged. First of all, is, you, is there a shortage right now at your hospital and in the Commonwealth? I think we have enough ventilators in Massachusetts and at my hospital to see us throughout this pandemic. 
make no mistake, a couple of weeks ago there was a concern. I think Governor Baker did whatever he could to get more ventilators here. I feel comfortable right now at my hospital that we have enough ventilators. Now, with that said, there could be, there was a concern that we would have to con potentially ration care. And that's why we came up with these crisis standards of care that were adopted a couple of weeks ago, guidelines that the state put out. And each hospital will have to create their own certain guidelines for their patient population. Now, there was some pushback with respect to who were these crisis standards of care were going to prioritize or not. A lot of us spoke up concerned that communities of color were going to be disproportionately impacted. And luckily, unfortunately, um, the governor and Secretary Sutter's revised those guidelines. Lines. So uh, that was my second question. You've not had a point where you have to say, okay, this person gets, uh, gets a ventilator, this person needs it, but is not going to get it right now. You've never had to face that as a doctor? Absolutely not, and that's not a position I want to be in. Right now, I think the Commonwealth at large and the hospital system and the, and the healthcare providers have done a tremendous job in scaling up capacity, not just ICUs and ventilators, but having the human resource capacity to provide uh, the care that folks need right now. But doctor, we're hearing some stories about the long-term effects of ventilators could be potentially harmful. Are these, are these just anomalies or is this something that's, that's alarming? No, I mean, ventilators, I mean, long before COVID-19 was here, ventilators are scary things. To put someone on a ventilator, to put someone on a breathing tube, that procedure in and of itself is a risky one that, you know, predisposes someone to having potentially a cardiac arrest or death. Uh, and so when you put someone on a ventilator, um, throughout their process, they might be exposed to pneumonia, um, they could get sick. I mean, we're looking at anywhere 50 to 80% of people who get on ventilators don't often get off ventilators. So it's a very um, important and difficult decision to, to put someone on a ventilator. And what we've seen over the course of this uh, pandemic, because the science and the clinical care is also evolving. And so initially we were quick to put people on ventilators because they had come in with very low oxygen numbers. But what we've seen is that we've been able to save them off with other kind of adjuncts, whether that's a nasal cannula, um, a couple of prongs in their nose to kind of beef up their oxygen status to really keep them off the ventilator. So uh, let's, uh, you, in addition to being a doctor, you're also a politician. So as you look at how we are handling this pandemic, could we as the United States of America be doing a better job? I mean, absolutely. Uh, you know, I, I think the leadership coming from the federal government is been abysmal, particularly from President Trump's office. And the bipartisan, the, I mean, the partisanship has just been horrendous. And I'm happy to be at a Commonwealth where, you know, although we have a Republican governor and a democratically led legislature, we worked hand in hand to get the job done here. Now, now, make no mistake, we're nowhere near, uh, you know, seeing the end of this virus. But the message and the miscommunication coming out of the uh, Washington, D.C., um, is, is difficult to see uh, on a daily basis. Um, as you know, the president has been giving us some, I guess you would call it non-scientific advice. Um, but yeah. on the ground, do you see people taking this seriously or not? I mean, the more recent issue with, you know, should we disinfect ourselves by drinking bleach? Not really. You know, there were some issues with respect to hydroxychloroquine, and some patients were asking for those, and some weren't. And, you know, we, I think a lot of hospitals were often given hydroxychloroquine over the past couple of weeks, or, or past couple of days, rather. Some have decided to, to scale that back, given the new studies that are coming out. But, uh, you know, the president has such an important role in this and his uh, inability to communicate important scientific uh, knowledge is concerning to a lot of us. I mean, it's really difficult to unweave the politics of this pandemic with the politics of today. And that's why it's so important that we go out there, we do our research, that we elect leaders who have, you know, America's best interest at heart, who believe in science and, um, and who are going to work for us. Let's branch out a little bit. Should we be following the same procedures and protocols um, as countries like South Korea, who seem to have had a, bit, a very good handle on controlling the virus, at least so far? Um, or is the size and the culture of the United States just too different for us to follow the lead of other countries? Well, every country has their own way of, of handling certain issues. I think, you know, you know, when I look at how we do things in Boston or across the Commonwealth or how we even interact with patients from a certain community, it's up to those of us on the ground to understand the, the complexities and the context and to come up with strategies um, to, um, to, to 
to do what we need to do. And so I think here in Massachusetts, you know, it's very difficult. You know, we're 50 different states, 50 different situations here. And, you know, in Massachusetts, we've been able to scale up testing and PPE because we have, uh, you know, academia industry and really marshal those resources to, you know, uh, address this virus. So we have to sort of reinvent the, reinvent the wheel in each state as opposed to just following something like what South Korea did. Is that what you're saying? I wouldn't say reinvent the wheel, but we have to really, you know, use the data that's on the ground here. And, and you know, this is not South Korea. You know, we're culturally a different country. Um, we have different expectations. You know, there, this wasn't a mask wearing country to begin with as other parts of Asia. Now, you know, moving forward, I think we're going to be a bit more comfortable with that. And I think, uh, you know, the norm will be to put on a mask now potentially when flu season arrives next year.